Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Let's start with several important general economic updates, then move to the main story for today: domestic concerns surrounding China's manufacturing exodus. And the world's slow move away from made in China. Today is the final day of the May Day or Labor Day holiday period. As we said on Monday, businesses across China are hoping to tap pent-up demand for Chinese consumers who are enjoying their first big holiday period since the end of zero COVID and the massive first wave of infections. Policymakers will be watching the numbers very closely. As they desperately need a strong rebound in consumption this year, to maintain growth and give them the space necessary for much-needed reforms, the consumption levels for this week will act as a nice proxy for consumer confidence in Q2. The good news for these policymakers is that so far. The numbers look very good. Preliminary data indicated that record-breaking travel rates would be seen, with projections suggesting over 240 million Chinese people traveling during the five-day holiday period. More than seven million tourists arrived in Shanghai alone on day one. Then, according to data from the Transport Ministry, more than 159 million trips were made by car, rail, airplane, and waterways in the first three days of the five-day travel period, a 162 percent increase versus the same period last year. And almost matching the pre-pandemic levels in 2019. Though some may not believe the official numbers, these do suggest good trends at the very least. Anecdotally, too, social media is awash with video and images of massive crowds at tourism hotspots and train stations. I've made sure to avoid these tourist areas, and taxi drivers have told me that they won't even drive near them in fear of getting stuck in traffic for hours. Mobility data tracked by Baidu Inc. also shows that traffic at China's major tourism attractions in the first three days of the holiday. Nearly doubled versus last year, according to numbers published by the Ministry of Commerce yesterday. Major retail and catering companies reported a 15.6 percent jump in sales on Monday versus a year ago. Automobile sales saw some of the best performance, with a 25 percent increase, and clothing a 24 percent increase. Quote. The combination of a steady uptick in consumer confidence, as well as the still incomplete release of pent-up demand, suggests to us that the consumer-led recovery still has room to run. End quote. Hong Hao, chief China economist at Grow Investment Group in Hong Kong, said that the surge in travel numbers quote smashed all expectations. End quote. These are positive signs for the Chinese economy, indeed. However, analysts caution that it will take some time before we know if the spending increase will continue through Q2, or if this is just a one-off explosion of pent-up demand after three years of repression. And of course, as we saw with the Q1 data, there are other parts of the economy: exports, manufacturing, employment, private investment. Housing, etc., that suggests that the 2023 recovery still remains shaky. The next few weeks and months will be critical. Next up, U.S. financial media outlet Bloomberg reports that Hong Kong has finally emerged from its recession in the first quarter, as quote the reopening of its borders revived spending. End quote. On Tuesday, the official data were published showing that the economy expanded. 2.7 percent in Q1 year on year, exceeding expectations. Bloomberg notes that the city is starting to recover after years of pandemic controls hammered the economy and spurred an exodus of residents. Retail sales by value rose to a three-year high in January as authorities began dismantling border controls between the city and the Chinese mainland. Visitor arrivals surged to 2.5 million in March, up 68 percent from February. Quote, Looking ahead, inbound tourism and domestic demand will remain the major drivers of economic growth this year. Visitor arrivals should recover further as transportation and handling capacity 
continue to catch up, end quote. Economists largely agree too. Quote, a continued comeback in terrorism, boosted by the end of COVID-0 in mainland China, is set to drive the recovery forward for the rest of the year. Reflecting the strong first quarter GDP, we're raising our 2023 growth forecast to 5.2%, up from the 3.2% we projected in February. That would more than make up the ground lost in 2022, when GDP shrank 3.5%. End quote. Yesterday, the IMF warned, however, that external risks remain for the Hong Kong economy, like global demand and credit tightening in major economies. And of course, whether or not mainland demand can sustain its recovery. Next up, according to the China Chamber of Commerce for Import and Export of Light Industrial Products, China's light industry exports declined 2.6% year on year to 207.48 billion US dollars in Q1. Quote, as Europe and the US battled the threat of recession and consumption slowed. End quote. An analyst for Chinese financial media outlet Yi Tsai writes that shipments of everyday consumer goods are an important barometer of China's total exports. Light industry involves common but important consumer products like footwear, furniture, toys, and kitchenware, accounting for about one quarter of all Chinese exports. Despite the slowdown, the chamber's vice president, in an interview with domestic financial media, expressed confidence of the resilience of light industry exports and expects steady growth in 2023. However, a recent report from Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin observes based on interviews at this year's Canton Fair, that, quote, global importers have significantly reduced new orders from China, end quote. And indeed, this leads us to our next topic, China's manufacturing exodus. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. It's just me making these episodes every day. It's a lot of work, but your guys' support is a huge source of motivation. Subscribing and sharing is a huge help as well. And for those who can go the extra mile and help me keep the channel financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin has produced an excellent article detailing the nature of China's manufacturing for export composition changes over time as factories diversify whether due to geopolitical concerns or economic pressures like labor costs, etc., to other manufacturing bases across Asia and the wider world. The Tsai analysts, citing several domestically and internationally produced reports, specifically look at China's share of U.S. imports. So we note that these data are related to U.S. imports only, but as the largest consumer market in the world, in absolute spending terms, this does give us a good idea of general trends. As we can see, in 2022, the Chinese mainland and Hong Kong accounted for a combined 50.7% of U.S. imports of manufactured goods from the 14 Asian localities, down from 53.5% in 2021. Quote, continuing a downward trend that began in 2013. End quote, in the words of management consulting firm Kearney in their annual reshoring index report. China's share continued to decline even though U.S. imports of manufactured goods from the region grew 11% in 2022 to more than 1 trillion U.S. dollars. Vietnam, India, Taiwan and Thailand have been the biggest beneficiaries to these changes. There are other winners too. Quote, the nation's manufacturing exodus is likely to benefit some of the traditionally less industrialized nations, such as Cambodia. Between 2018 and 2022, Cambodia's electronics exports to the U.S. grew at a compound annual growth rate of 128%, albeit from a very small base. End quote. What's going on then? Quote, there has been a shift of manufacturing away from the Chinese mainland in Hong Kong, with many companies adapting their supply chains to reduce dependence on the nation due to concerns such as intellectual property, tariffs, geopolitical tensions, and supply chain resilience caused by Chinese government policies. End quote. Major consumer electronics companies like Apple Inc. and Samsung Electronics Co. Limited have been part of this ongoing shift. 
According to Everbright Securities Co., in a research note published last year, among Apple's top 200 suppliers, the number of companies setting up plants in Vietnam increased from 17 in 2018 to 23 in 2020, with about a third of these being Chinese companies themselves moving. The report adds that a similar trend was noted in the apparel and textile industry. Of course, China remains a huge manufacturing player, and a decline in manufacturing is not uncommon for many economies as their labor costs increase. However, it does seem clear that, at the very least, if these trends continue or accelerate, it may be that we are seeing the end of an era, that the dominance of made in China is coming to an end. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful day wherever you are, and I will see you all tomorrow.